So I'm just going to talk a little bit about preserving stuff at home, in particular looking at jams and jellies and pickles and chutneys. They're, they're obviously uh, two completely different sort of things. What we're trying to do is stop the food going off. Originally, it was because if you didn't do that, you had a very boring diet for the rest of the, all over the winter, because obviously nothing grew in the winter, so you had to sort of do things with whatever was there uh, to try to make your diet a little, a tiny bit more interesting. But most of the things we do are so drastic that they change the thing completely. So you're not re you don't really make strawberry jam because you want strawberries in the winter. You make strawberry jam because you like strawberry jam, because it's very, very different. And most of the things we do are very different. We're, we're trying to stop bacteria to some extent, but mainly yeasts and moulds from growing. Because yeasts and moulds will grow in conditions that bacteria won't. So they're much, you know, they're much um, more sort of robust in that, in that, in that sense, really. So um, what we've got to do is either kill the things off, or We've got to make the conditions in the jar or wherever you're putting them in so nothing else, so it won't grow. And usually it's a sort of mixture of both. Music. So the only really, ex ex I suppose, exception to that would be freezing. I'm not going to talk about freezing because you just put it in the freezer and that's pretty, pretty straightforward. So I'm just going to talk about these various other things. So what we're going to do, what we do then, and we have to put something in the food to stop the yeast and moulds growing. And we're either going to use sugar which makes uh, essentially makes much less water available because it's because the sugar it, I won't go to get too technical about it but you've probably all heard about osmosis and, and dissolving sugar and, and how that sort of um, holds the water in and that's one way of doing it because the water isn't available although there's still quite a bit of water there most there's hardly any foods that are less than about uh, what 30 35 percent water, even though the, even dry foods have got a very large amount of water in them. But the water is not available, there's not enough water available to allow the yeast and mold to go. So that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to chemically change the thing, and what we usually do is use vinegar. That is an acid, ethanoic acid used to be called acetic acid, drops the pH below the level at which. Uh, the bat, the moulds or the yeasts are able to grow. So we, we're going to do one or other of those. And I'll just have a, have a pretty quick look at either and show you something. I'm not even really going to, you can't do, I can't make any, it takes hours usually to make this stuff. That'll, that'll be for a workshop or something we, which we have a sort of idea of doing at some point. It'll have to be at least a half a day or, or even longer if we're, if we're going to actually get people making the stuff. So I'm just going to give you some, some, some idea, tips if you like, that I've uh, developed over many, many years uh, um, of making jams and jellies and chutneys and whatever. Um, as, as Jen, and that's my wife over there, my long-suffering wife will testify, we tend to have fairly large quantities of these things. About, and there's, there's a selection of them there. I've put those out to show you the different sorts of containers and things. I'll say something a little bit about that in a minute. So let's look at the uh, jams and jellies first, really. The trick, what you use in making jams and jellies, there's a sort of inclination to use stuff that's surplus, which is obviously what you want to do because it's cheap and free. But what you ought to do is use good quality stuff. If you use poor quality fruit, you'll get poor quality jam at the end of it. So you don't use the, all the overripe stuff that's going a bit mouldy and whatever, because you'll just get not brilliant jam, which is likely to go mouldy. So use reasonably, it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be pretty stuff, it can be misshapen stuff and all that sort of stuff, but, but not sort of stuff that's going off really, because you, you can't make something good from something that's not really good. You can't, it's not going to reverse the sort of um, process of decay or something. So use a good stuff, and ideally for fruit, use it slightly underripe, because the pectin, which is in the fruit, which makes it set, there's more of it in underripe fruit than there is in all the ripe fruit, fully ripe fruit. So slightly underripe, so it's the, the flavours develop that. So um, that's sort of what you're looking for already. Just a few kind of just practical tips really. Cook the fruit properly before you put the sugar in. Now how much you need to cook it depends upon what sort of fruit it is. If it's a hard fruit you need to cook it a bit more. If it's a soft fruit like raspberries or blackberries or something then pretty much by the time you boil it to boil it's cooked anyway. But it needs to be cooked before you add any sugar. Otherwise you'll find you get rather tough bits of fruit in it. 
the, the, the sugar sort of toughens up the fruit if it's not fully cooked to start with. So that's, uh, that's one trick. And use the minimum amount of water that, the, that you can get away with, usually. The, the, jellies are a little bit different, because jellies, you, you're trying to extract the pectin. And you can make jellies, you have to have a fair bit of pectin in the fruit. I'll say something about the sort of fruit you might do with that in a minute. But you need to, don't put too much water in, because what you're going to spend most of your time doing is boiling the water off at the end. So the more water you put in the beginning, the more water you've got to boil up at the end, the longer it takes, the more steam you've got in the kitchen, the sugar starts to caramelise slightly, and you get fed up waiting for it. So as little water as possible, and for a lot of fruits, especially things like the soft fruits, like raspberries, and so, you, can, you don't really need any water. As long as you start cooking gently in the first place, you don't really need to add any water. And you better not to, because I say you haven't then got to uh, boil it off afterwards. What you need to do, you need to have a pan which is suitable. This is a very old pan which I've had for many, many, we probably haven't, how long have we done this, Jen? More since we've married, so we've had 40 odd years. Um, it, the, 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 the two things you need to look out for a pan, you can go to Lake with it buy a, a rather posh one these days, stainless steel, is a thick bottom and a big open space at the top. Because you're going to put a lot of heat in the bottom, and the thicker the bottom, the better the heat sort of spread and doesn't burn the, 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 the sugar mixture on it. And the, the big top means it evaporates more quickly. So, hard, hard bottom, uh, thick bottom, big thick. Now, and, and this is obviously designed for the purpose. And that, if you want to do it in a sports saucepan, you can, but you need to use a big saucepan. And whatever you're using, you want it no more than about a third full. Because what you need to do, once you've got the sugar in and you start boiling it up, you need to boil it as rapidly as you possibly can to speed the process up and, and cause less damage. And if you have more than about a third of it full, you can just about get away with a little bit more than that sometimes, is you simply find that you get it coming over and meeting you all. And believe me, once it's boiled over, it's a, it's a devil's own job to get off your stove again. Do you stir it? Well, well yeah, that's a good point. When you're putting, when you, what I do is I cook the fruit, then I put the sugar in, and gradually warm that up and keep it stirring while until the sugar is entirely dissolved. Once the sugar is dissolved, don't stir it too much. Uh, you, you might need to do just a little one occasionally just to make sure it's not catching on the bottom. But basically, don't stir it because if you start stirring it, you start making the, the change the, the sugar is a weird thing when it's in uh, a soup. Uh, in, in a solution like this, there's so much sugar in it, it starts to crystallise and things like that. So, you know, basically, once you've got it going, don't stir it. Um, but you need to keep a good rolling boil, right up to the, uh, as fast as you can, but this is a point which you need some patience, because you've got to keep a rolling boil, you've got to, that's the other way, boiling very, very vigorously, uh, and unless you've got, you've got to be very careful it doesn't boil over. So don't leave it. This is not the time to say, oh, we'll make a cup of tea or I'll just go and do that. Because you come back and you've got uh, a layer on the stove which will take you days to get off. Because once it's a, a, a high sugar solution and it's cooked on the top of your stove, it's a very difficult thing to get off. And it smells pretty bad as well because it starts to burn and all that sort of stuff. You do need to be careful with incident. You're talking about something which is well over the boiling point of water, which sticks. So if it gets on you, it sticks on you. And so you need to be close to a cold tap, just in case. Because the, the, the only thing to do is if you get any on you, is immediately get to the cold tap. So you, you just watch that. And uh, don't peer at it too closely, because as it gets up to the point at which you're just about to put it in the jars, it'll start spitting at you. And if you're looking at it too closely, which is why, let me come to something else. The easiest way to make sure you've got the right sugar content, and what you're doing when you're boiling the water off, is, is boiling the water off so the sugar content is getting higher and higher and higher. And you need to get it to the right sugar content. A, to make it set. B, to make it, uh, uh, keep it preserved, stop it going mouldy or whatever. And by far the easiest way to do that is to use a thermometer. There are also, if you look at a book, it'll tell you you can put it on a little saucer and push it with your finger and all that sort of palaver, which you can do, you can do. That only really tells you if it's going to set. It doesn't really tell you if the sugar content's high enough. Whereas if you use a thermometer and you've got everything else right, which you can get from most recipes, then that's so I would strongly recommend, if you're going to make jam or jelly, buy a thermometer. I 
use a digital one because it means I don't have to be peering at it. One of the problems with the ones with the, uh, the, the old fashioned one which Granny had with a, with a glass tube in and things, you've got to be looking at it like that. So you're looking over a spitting thing. So my strong preference is to use the digital. This is actually my. I guess this is a, just a new one. Jen just bought me because I managed to break the last two fairly rapid orders. Uh, this one actually sticks on the on the on our. Spl we've got a metal splash back, so it's actually magnetic. So that's quite good. And and so I'm a long way. I'm measuring the temperature a long way away from the thing. So that's they're, about, they're about ten or eleven pounds. Oh, so I should say that because he thought it was a lot more expensive. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what do I was in the middle? Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but you can't do that thermometer. And I always, I always do it. I always uh, cook this down next year. To I need to translate this because uh, uh, my first degree was food science, and uh, food industry is a very old-fashioned industry. And it often works in Fahrenheit, um, the old-fashioned uh, thing, which is and it goes. The, it's, a, it's a neat number. It's 222 Fahrenheit. Um, is what I cook the, the, the jam to, which is about 105.5 Celsius. So, but that's the sort of temperature. As long as it's above about 220 Fahrenheit, about 104.5, it'll do. I always do it a little bit more. But just be warned, it takes a long, long time to get up to about 104, and then much less time to get the last little bit. So you think, oh, it's taking ages and ages and ages and ages, no, no, no. and suddenly you look at it and you realise it's gone over. Um, because as you get less and less water, what's left goes off quickly, more quickly and quickly and quickly. So just, uh, just be careful about that. Um, then uh, what I then do, I take it off the germ. If there's any scum, I, I, well, I should have said, if you get a, some fruits uh, produce a lot of froth, a lot of foam when you're doing it. And um, the best way to sort of reduce that, you can't ever get rid of it, reduce it, is to put a knob of butter in, about a walnut-sized lump of butter um, in it, or you can use, mar don't use low-fat margarine, use mar proper margarine, cook it or do, or butter, and it keeps, it changes the surface tension and keeps the foam down a bit. Um, when it gets to the temperature, it's, you either need to just turn off the heat, or if you've got a gas hob or an induction hob, you can, you, you, that's, that's fine. Otherwise, you probably need to move it away from the heat. If you've got an electric hot plate or something, there's a, the, it'll keep on. Uh, and you don't really want that. Once you've got it to the right temperature, you need to, to move it off the heat. Uh, and then I either usually skim the, the, any remaining froth off and put that in a separate jar and eat that tomorrow, sort of thing, with it for breakfast. Um, and the rest put in jars. Now, it doesn't really matter what jars you use. Always use glass jars. Um, there's a selection of various sizes, sometimes it's, it's, sometimes it's a question of needs and must, because we make a lot of jam and we're often struggling about to get enough jars, but um, it doesn't really matter, depending on whether you're going you're gonna to give them away and it's precious jam, you probably want to use small jars, if, if you just want to put it to one, you may want one bigger ones. Marmalade I usually make, you may, and that was like, like that, just from the, the beetroot one, Jen, at the back. Um, the beetroot oh, one, yes, like, yes, I yes, usually yes, use yours yes, for marmalade, because yes, yes. I use a lot of marmalade. <laughs> That sort of stuff. It doesn't really matter. What you need to have, though, is a good seal. Now, you can use, reuse the seal that comes with the jam uh, quite a few times. As long as it looks in good condition, um, you can reuse it quite a while. I don't use cellophane these days. It looks nice and it's and all that, but the trouble with cellophane is porous. So after a, a few weeks or months, the jam's dried out. Um, a bit. So I tend to use um, the, the, the metal tops in. You need to fill the jars as full as you possibly can without getting all over the place. Because um, you want to leave as small a gap at the top as you can. You put the lid on, the stuff shrinks as it contracts because it cools down, and you've got a sort of semi-vacuum of the top, which keeps the stuff in good condition. Do you use the wax circles as well? I don't no. usually do the wax circles. You can no, use wax no, circles. No, okay. There is a wax circle on that. No, 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 no. I don't use wax. Well. So now, heard to, pop, yeah, when I yeah, it, yeah. yeah. To get it in the jar, you either need a funnel, but you need to make sure the jar, that that will fit in your in your uh, jars if you use that, and the smaller jars it won't fit in. Or you need a small jug, or you need a steady hand. 